Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Liana Nisanova and we're gonna be talking about how to flip properties. Liana has a lot of experience in this space and I'm so excited that she's here to share her knowledge with us. Before we get into it with Liana, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And now without further ado, let's get into it. Liana, so great to have you here. Thanks for joining me. Why don't you give everyone a bit of a background of who you are and what you do as a real estate investor? Hi, Darren. Thank you for the invite. Uh, so I've been investing in real estate over 10 years. And uh, like years ago, we just bought condos for the sake of buying because everybody was buying properties without any knowledge what the uh, cash flow means. And we only banked on appreciation. And I guess we were lucky. <laughs> they appreciated <laughs> greatly. And we could refinance a bunch of them. Uh, like three, four years ago, and we started doing flipping properties um, in 2017. The reason was that my husband lost the business at the end, at the beginning of 2016, and we were looking for the year, what are we going to do? And since I had this passion for the real estate, it just seemed as the right way to go for. And so you got into flipping properties in 2017? Yeah. And you've done over 10 flips since then? Mm-hmm. Wow. So almost three a year you're doing essentially right now, or is it, is it more than that? So yeah, it's the well, last year we did four. Mm -hmm. 2019 was slow for many. Re no, it was 2017 when it was slow. We only done two at that time. We bought in the wrong time. We bought at the wrong price <laughs> and, and it took us a long time to sell. So it slowed us down. Um, last year we did four this year we were going to do a bunch of them but again COVID-19 hit us and we slowed down again how do you find the majority of the deals that you do in when it comes to flipping properties so it's a combination of everything we still buy a bunch of them off MLS uh, some of them we buy from um, wholesalers and we also have a website that attracts the sellers with the distressed houses so it's a bit of everything. As long as the numbers work, it really doesn't matter where the deal comes from. So when you're putting out your marketing for, um, is that on Facebook or is that just um, like you do Google AdWords or how does that marketing work and how do those leads come to you? On the meantime, it's mostly SEO. Mm. We actually, we created a website last year, haven't done much about that. And this year in February, I hired a marketer and we are working on SEO mostly. We're going to start um, with PPC with some ads, um, probably in the fall. When you're acquiring these properties, whether that's through MLS or through, through private means, um, what's, what's the next, like, how do you, what's the next step in the process? Essentially, are you looking at, obviously you're looking at what you're purchasing the property for. How are you determining the after repair value on properties? Are you looking at comparables in the neighborhood or what's the criteria that you're using to be able to find out your, your upside when you're done? So we look at the properties that were sold and on the market and in that particular neighborhood. And um, when we look at the price, we look at what it will sell for once we renovate. We look at the size of the property, we look at the age, and we look at um, style of the house. So based on that, then we make a decision, okay, um, the main point here, you have to buy the price where there is enough of spread to profit after all the renovations. And is there a target spread that you're hoping to achieve on each property? So uh, the calculation starts backwards. So maximum purchase price is at 80% of ARV minus renovation. Okay. So you're hoping to make a 20% profit essentially after you've paid for all your costs. and Not really because 10% uh, uh, we actually count for uh, holding periods, cost of the money and so on. So we usually we say the minimum 10%, we, but we never ended up with 10%. We usually end up around 15, 20% of the profit. Oh, nice. So uh, you've actually exceeded your expectations when it comes to your budgeting. Though I do calculation with the minimum beer. So if that minimum beer works for me, then anything above and over. So how do you calculate the renovation costs? I mean, obviously you've been doing this enough now that you have a pretty good system in place, but give us a little bit of insight on, on your system and how you calculate the renovation costs. So once we look at the comparables, uh, we look at the houses that actually sold quickly and we look at their finishes and then we try to create similar or better home. And once we have it, we, we decide what kind of improvements are going to add the value to the house. 
we go into three stages. Stage number one is when we prior prioritize. So we look at everything we wanted to be done to the house, and then we divide it into two uh, parts, needs and wants. Mm. And it's based on the budget. And we come to that answer by asking ourselves four simple questions. Question number one, what do we want to do to this project? What do we have to be doing to get to that point? What are we going to splurge and what we can get go, like let go? So once we have that, when we come to the list of things that's to be done, and it brings us to step number two. Step number two, when we actually create the spreadsheet that includes every part of renovation. And uh, next to that, we're going to have estimates for the cost of each part of the renovation, which includes uh, labor and uh, materials. So once we have that budget and we go to step three, uh, then we try to find the trades that can, can complete that part of the renovation within our budget. I'm, I'm sure you have a cost per item or a cost per square foot, cost per linear foot, depending on, on what that item is. Um, do you find that that transfers from project to project, or obviously it may differ depending on the location and the property and what you're, what you're doing. So like I know lots of people have detailed spreadsheet. We don't. So we, so we usually say the renovation of the bathroom at the low end is 5,000. More high end could be seven, 8,000. Again, for the kitchen, if it's uh, more like cookie cutter house, the kitchen can cost seven, 8,000. Uh, you can end up with 14, 15,000 in the kitchen, right? Mm. So it's, it's more the basic. I, we don't really do like really detailed cost because you, you always go over budget. Yeah. <laughs> Never done a renovation that's been on time or on budget. <laughs> exactly. So you always go over budget. So I know people say hundred dollar per square foot or whatever. We don't really calculate it because, um, everything on the move, right? So what happens when we buy the property, you decide what we're going to do first. And then, as I said, you add your wants and is it a want, is it a need? So you separate it and you really, it goes down to the bottom. Who's going to be your buyer? Are they going to pay for what you want to do to this particular property? How long do you budget in the timeline for your average project? Again, it depends on what kind of project it's going to be. Uh, depend on the size and complexity. Something simple, cosmetic changes can take anything four to six weeks. Uh, when we go to major renovation, uh, usually three to six months, mm -hmm. just a renovation. We're not talking about, you know, then holding period to sell the house and closing. And there's always delay, you know, no, and delays are common. Some of them you can control, some of them you have no control about. So the one that you can control is, um, you know, if you plan out, if you have all your trades lined up, and some of the delays you have no control about, like permits. Um, the project mm -hmm. where we are, next project, it's actually a single bungalow, small bungalow, 700, and we're going to build 3,200 square foot house there. It's more like an addition. Mm -hmm. And we thought the permits will take us two months and it's been four months and we still don't have it. Wow. So permits, weather, uh, coronavirus. <laughs> I mean, there could be so many reasons that can delay you, right? What locations are you focusing on now? Um, and and does, has that changed over time or have you always kind of worked in the same area? So we started with Toronto. We were flipping condos in Toronto. And honestly, I love them. It's so much less work. We still did the gut renovation. We're still doing the reconfiguration, but there was no windows. There were no roofs. <laughs> like, so it was so much easier. But it came to the point when we could not afford to buy those condos anymore because we were in a market when the purchase price was like eight, 900, close to the million. Because you only could be more or less secure with the sale price if you ended up buying in a Forest Hill or downtown core. So we decided we have to move out of GTA and we do flips now for the year Kitchen in Cambridge, simply because I found a partner for myself. But moving forward, as my website going to bring the deals, I think I'm going to start looking outside of Kitchen in Cambridge. You know, wherever I'm going to end up, if I don't wholesale, if I decide to 
Wholesaling is not something that I really want to concentrate and I want to stay away from wholesaling. But, you know, I might just JV with other contractors or other partners to flee because it's going to be quite complicated to do all over. I still work full time in the healthcare, so. And, and even Kitchener and Cambridge uh, is a competitive market, but are, you're still finding obviously margin there that you can be successful on your flips. Um, and is that just, it's, it's a matter of buying right and then and really having your, your system down? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it works because my partner, he's a general contractor, but he's my partner. So uh, he doesn't make money of me because we'll partner up. So it's a cost and we don't really hire a GC because he's the one who's managing, we, we hire trades. So it's much cheaper. And I guess we pick up the projects of MLS that nobody wants, like galvanized pipes, not being tubes, so more complicated projects. What are you renovating and what are you leaving in most cases? So I know that you can spend a lot of money behind the walls, um, but it doesn't translate to a lot of value when you go to sell the property. So which items do you often leave for a potential future owner and which ones are a must that you have to like deal with and replace? Okay, if we don't have to do roof, we're not going to touch roof. <laughs> Same comes to the uh, windows. Uh, we try to improve outside, but uh, we made one mistake. We spent too much money and it became, sh we lost money on a profit because we spent too much money outside. So we're trying to be careful really what people want they like, it has to look beautiful. You know, first impression is important, but what you need is kitchen and bathrooms, new floors, you know. And again, uh, I was used to the luxury innovation when I used to do condos in Toronto because I was at, my buyers were mostly people who were moving from the houses of couple of million to the million dollar condo. So they were minimizing and they mm -hmm. wanted the luxury. So when I came to the kitchen in Cambridge, I was at the beginning, I was insisting to change all the doors because I'm used to those glass panel doors. And I remember we had almost a fight with my partner and he said, no, just leave those old flat doors. I said, like, what do you mean? Like people want to, you know, he said, no, nobody cares. And I was shocked that nobody cared. They bought the houses with <laughs> flat doors because, you know, kitchen is beautiful, bathroom is beautiful. So nobody really pay attention to the doors. <laughs> and again, you know, it depends. Um, I mean, the last house that we flipped, it's more in the higher range for the kitchener. We sold it for 840. We just removed the conditions a couple of days ago. So when you attract the buyer, you cannot have a carpet. But if it's a first time home buyer for 500, you know, if we can go away with a carpet in the bedroom, we go away with the carpet because it doesn't really add much value to the house. So your, your partnership with your, um, your general contractor, essentially, um, you are, I'm guessing, dealing with, so what are the responsibilities, roles and responsibilities? He's obviously managing construction. Um, and are you bringing the capital to the table? How are you financing the transaction? Do you use private money um, or do you go to the banks and get and finance, finance it that way? So again, if the, that project, I don't just flip. People think I only flip the properties. I do have portfolio of buy and hold, which I flip to myself with a burr. Yeah. So if, if it's that type of project, then we try to go with the A bank, we get you know, low rate financing. For the flipping projects, you, I made a mistake once when for my first project in Kitchener, I thought, because I used to finance with the A lender condos here. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do the same thing, but it didn't work because the properties in Kitchener and Cambridge are much more worse condition and banks don't wanna finance it. And obviously, if you flip property within four months, bank don't want to finance as well. They don't, they don't like flipping projects. So we do private money mostly. So my relationship started with my partner. He is a flipper as well. He was flipping projects before me, and we just combine our resources and skills. So the first couple of projects, I was coming with majority of financing, and he was coming with whatever was um, over budget. And the way we actually uh, separated, um, when we buy the property, uh, he comes with the initial budget. Then when we have a walkthrough, I add a huge list of items, probably more wants than needs. And we actually kind of cooperate and stop somewhere in between. So I am the one who actually designing the properties. I'm the one who requests things. And he's the one who tells me, can we or cannot we do it? 
I, I don't really get into the details as where the HVAC going to be installed. I don't care. But I, I, all I care, can we open the wall and how can we reconfigure the property? So design part, uh, choice of the finishes, staging, it's me. And uh, last couple of projects, we have money partners. So I'm the one who's responsible to find the money. We have the money partner who brought down payment renovation money. We still have um, private money for the uh, first mortgage position. But the money partner, it's a silent partner. He doesn't make any decisions. So I'm the one who actually puts the deals together, I guess, now. Buy the property, you renovate it, um, you finish it. Do you professionally stage it or do you have, um, do you stage them yourself or do you stage them at all? I stage all my properties myself. It's my passion. I love doing that. Uh, though we did not stage a couple properties because we pre-sold them. So it hmm. was the easier part. They were, at the same time, I felt bad because I missed that part of staging and seeing the complete finished project. I think uh, first impression is very important. And people usually make their decision on, um, on a property uh, the first and second. And people don't buy just uh, the structure. They buy dreams, you know, they want to, uh, they buy the lifestyle. So by staging, you actually sell them dreams and it's more emotional purchase. And I think staging is very valuable because when you stage, you try minimize imperfections and you actually maximize the strength of the properties and um, allow to show the property their maximum potential. So when you're selling properties, are you doing that on your own or are you, are you uh, doing for sale by owner or do you list with a real estate agent? So uh, once we purchase the property, we always have a sign in front of the house uh, where it says we buy houses with my phone number and my website. Funny enough, we had more people reaching out to purchase the price as opposed to sell. Though we're trying to attract sellers, but we attract more buyers. Uh, but, but it did not work at the end of the day because when people buy at the early stage, they, they really try to lowball you. Hmm. So we always use the seller. My husband is a realtor. Sometimes he calls us, but usually we try to use the realtor. And we have wonderful realtor in Kitchen and Cambridge who is a local realtor. And it works much better when a local realtor sells your house. Can you break it down for us? Just give us some numbers on the last transaction that you did. Are you okay to do that? Yeah, sure. The last project, the one that we just sold, and actually uh, it's firm now. We bought it for it was listed for 550 we purchased a 505 initial right. Right. it was list, listed for what it was listed for 550 okay on mls back in november last year we purchased it for 505 it still was good timing it wasn't beating worse at that time so we we're lucky enough i guess a 505 initial budget was around 115 we ended up around 140 uh simply because of the delays mm. and we added a couple of things but there were delays adding up we had because we were planning to sell it in march and we sold it at we just we were planning to list it in march and we just listed in may because of COVID and everything anyway to, to long story short 505 140 renovation initially uh, remember i told you i go with the low arv so my ARV initially was 790, 750. I went with lower, so I said 750. Mm -hmm. And we were planning to make around 75,000 between three partners. We thought within four months, we're going to be in and out. Uh, it took us eight months. It's going to be eight months closing to closing. We sold it for 840. Wow. Yeah. And actually we, would, we were planning to sell it for 870, almost 120,000 above of initial ARV. Mm -hmm. But because of, because of the COVID-19 again, and I, did, I, I became impatient. I said, okay, let's just, we listed for 880. We were on the market for the month. If I don't get offer within a month, I usually try to decrease by five, 6% just to get things moving. So 840, we're going to profit around 100,000 on that property. Nice. And that's after closing costs, carrying costs, everything, 100,000 yeah. in your pocket, split by three partners. Yeah. Is that including capital gains or would you pay capital gains outside of that? So each of us going to pay, it's not a capital gain because it's active business, right? Mm. So okay. we, so it's more of an active business and each partner. Or yeah, sorry, income tax would be paid yeah. on that based on your... Um, 
based on your, you know, mon money that you bring in every single year. Yeah, not capital gains. My apologies. Yeah, that's fine. So each partner actually takes care of their own property. I mean, tax purposes. So the way, uh, I mean, working partner can write off something. I can write off something. So everybody takes care of their own purposes. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, that's, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a little bit crazy times right now because of what's going on. But if that had, if your, if your timeline had, you know, gone to what you, what your expectations were, it's pretty, pretty solid transaction in and out for, for that kind of uh, return. Yeah, it would be like, I think we would make around 150,000 though. Initially I did not promise, you know, you really never promise. You just, you know, with the flipping, you cannot promise anything. It's not like lending money, right? So mm -hmm. uh, you just say we can make potentially that much. And I initially said potentially we're going to make hundred thousand. Then we thought we're going to make hundred fifty, and it looked perfect. It looked like we're going to do it. But I mean, that's a life. COVID happened and delays, right? We were delayed by a few months, so every month cost us around four thousand just to hold the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it adds up after a while, right? That private money and uh, and all of those things. So, but it was a success, and you've obviously got a system in place, and you're doing this more and more. And and I think the more and more, obviously, that you do it, the the better you get at it, and the better your system gets. And uh, mm -hmm. it's it, it you, you're 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 a success story for sure when it comes to flipping properties. And I know that a lot of people are looking to you for for advice. And so, you know, thank you so much for joining us today and like really walking us through the system that you use. Uh, if people want to reach out to you. I'm going to leave your information in the description okay. below. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session today with Leanna, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel and um, feel free to leave comments and questions below for us. And we're happy to answer those for you. Um, you can also check me out on Facebook, Instagram, and my website at darrenboros.com. Leanna, thanks again for being here today. I really appreciate you taking some time to walk us through that. I wish you the best of success moving forward. And I look forward to hearing about your future deals and what's going on in your life. Thank you. Thanks for the name, Mike. Yeah, no problem. Bye for now. Bye-bye.